As a medical student, we have learned that consciousness is a product of brain function. And we have to, it is a never proven hypothesis, and we have to discuss this again, because people with cardiac arrest, we know, and there have been studies done, that when you have cardiac arrest, within seconds you lose consciousness. There are no body reflexes anymore, which is a function of the cortex. There are no brain stem reflexes anymore, the gag reflex, the corneal reflex, and widened pupils are clinical findings. There's no breathing anymore, and the breathing center is close to the brain stem. And when you measure the electric activity of the brain, which is the EEG, you see a flatline EEG within 15 seconds. And we know that all patients with cardiac arrest, it takes more than 20 seconds, mostly 60 to 120 seconds before they are resuscitated, or mostly even longer. So we know that all these patients with this enhanced consciousness, with this uh, near-death experience, with cognition, with, with emotions, with clear thoughts, uh, with memories, happens during the period of a non-functioning brain. Mm. So the concept we had learned should be discussed again. And my, in my opinion now is that consciousness is not localized in the brain, and the brain has a facilitating function, and not a producing function to experience consciousness. So it is, it's an, it is a sender and a an, and an, and an receiver uh, for consciousness. Dr. Pin Van Lommel, you're a cardiologist and are the author of a very successful book entitled Consciousness Beyond Life, which has already been translated into very many languages. What drew you to examine the area of near-death experiences? What was the motive? Yeah. Well, as a cardiologist, you come in contact with a lot of people who survive cardiac arrest. And after I read a book about near-death experience by a medical, as a medical student, I had a near-death experience in 1943. After reading this book, I just wondered why do I never hear such stories. So I started to ask patients in 1986. And in two years out of 50 patients, 12 patients told me about their near-death experience. So, and then for me started a scientific curiosity because according to our current materialistic science, it is not possible to experience consciousness during cardiac arrest when the brain function has ceased. Some years ago, you conducted the first prospective study of near-death experiences. So, what did this study cover? What did you want to find out? Yeah, so the question was for me, how is it possible that people can experience an enhanced consciousness during cardiac arrest? And until that moment, there were, have been only been retrospective studies with a high selection of patients. And based on these studies, people thought that the experiences could be caused by lack of oxygen in the brain, anoxia, or fear of death, or hallucinations, or side effects of drugs. But it has never been, never been a real scientific prospective study. So in 1988, we started a prospective study in 10 Dutch hospitals with 344 consecutive survivors of cardiac arrest to study the cause and content of an NDE. And we studied uh, patients who survived cardiac arrest because they all are clinical dead. And clinical dead is the period of unconsciousness caused by the stopping of the circulation, no blood pressure, no circulation, no breathing at all. And this is the model most closer to the model of dying, because when you don't start CPR, within five to ten minutes, all patients will die. What were the most important findings from this study? Were there aspects that were actually very surprising for you? What we found in this 344 patients that 18% had indeed a period of enhanced consciousness during the period of cardiac arrest, and 82% did not have any experience at all. Mm. And 
was we found that the, these two groups were totally the same. So the duration of unconsciousness, two minutes or eight minutes or, or, or three weeks in coma, or the duration of cardiac arrest, two minutes or five minutes, didn't matter at all. To, so the severity of anoxia of the brain didn't matter at all. Uh, fear of death or the use of use medication or uh, foreknowledge that you know that these uh, experiences are possible or religion or or gender or education it didn't matter at all the two groups were totally the same which meant that we could conclude that there is no such physiological explanation like anoxia of the brain no psychological explanation like fear of death and no pharmacological explanation like the side effects of drugs that could explain these experiences. Then, taking an overview, what do we experience when we die? Are there specific stages reported by all people who have had near-death experiences? Yeah. So the near-death experience, uh, uh, people can uh, tell about several universal elements. The first is that they don't feel the pain in the body anymore, or it is a traffic accident or a cardiac arrest, myocardial infarction. They wonder, is this dead? I, am I dead or not? And then they can have an uh, out-of-body experience, from a perception from a position out and above their lifeless body. They can see their own resuscitation or their own traffic accident from above. And this is a very scientific, important aspect of the near-death experience, because you can corroborate the theoretical uh, perceptions of this out-of-body experience, and even the moment this uh, perception must have taken place. So it's a scientific important aspect of near-death experiences. Then it can come into a dark room, dark space, which can be frightening for some people. Then they see a small light where they're attracted to, which is described mostly as a, as, as a tunnel. Then they can enter a otherworldly dimension with beautiful colors, beautiful landscapes, beautiful music, where they can meet deceased relatives, sometimes even relatives they don't know they were dead. Then they can meet a light or a being of light, and mostly with this being of light they have a feeling of unconditional love and unknown wisdom. You get answers to all the questions before you ask them. And then they can have a life review, then you relive your whole life from birth on. And you uh, know all the thoughts, words and acts you ever had, also from other persons. So you are connected with the consciousness of other persons in the past as well. Sometimes they can have a flash forward, that is a life preview, that you can see future event of your personal life. They can come to a border and they know that when I cross this border I will never come back. And then mostly they are sent back, but it's not your time yet. And then they have the awful experience of the consciousness return into the sick body with all the pain and restriction of the disease again. These are the elements, but not all people have all these elements. Some have three or four, others have seven or eight of these elements. In your study, did you also look into the longer term effects of near-death experiences? Do people who have had such experiences change in a way that is lasting? This was also a very important aspect of our study. We did a long term of longitudinal study with all survivors of cardiac arrest with an NDE and a match control group of patients who also survived cardiac arrest but did not have any memories at all. To see if the classical transformation you hear from the patients, which is the loss of the fear of death, a new insight what is important in life, which is acceptance and love and empathy towards yourself as well as towards others and towards nature because you experience a total connectedness with everybody and with the planet. And the third thing is the enhanced intuitive sensibility, which means that they feel connected with other peoples as well, which is very disturbing. And the, 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 mostly the ND is positive, but because you cannot share your experience with others, it's for the, the first 10 or 20 years, it's a trauma. They have depression, loneliness, and, and homesickness to this experience. And the important thing was that what we found that the classical transformation only is seen in the people with an NDE. So the transformation is not due to the cardiac arrest, but to the NDE. So this is the objective part of the subjective experience. 
and the whole study, the prospective and the longitudinal study, was published in the Lancet in December 2001. Mm. Consciousness is often described as a function of the brain. On the other hand, there is the view that the brain does not produce consciousness, but rather is a receiving organ for consciousness. So what is your view? Where does consciousness come from? Does it arise in the brain, or can it also exist without the body? Yeah. As a medical student, we have learned that consciousness is a product of brain function. And we have to, it is a never proven hypothesis, and we have to discuss this again, because people with cardiac arrest, we know, and there have been studies done, that when you have cardiac arrest, within seconds you lose consciousness. There are no body reflexes anymore, which is a function of the cortex. There are no brain stem reflexes anymore, the gag reflex, the corneal reflex, and widened pupils are clinical findings. There's no breathing anymore, and the breathing center is close to the brain stem. And when you measure the electric activity of the brain, which is the EEG, you see a flatline EEG within 15 seconds. And we know that all patients with cardiac arrest, it takes more than 20 seconds, mostly 60 to 120 seconds before they are resuscitated, or mostly even longer. So we know that all these patients with this enhanced consciousness, with this uh, near-death experience, with cognition, with, with emotions, with clear thoughts, uh, with memories, happens during the period of a non-functioning brain. Mm. So the concept we had learned should be discussed again. And my, in my opinion now is that consciousness is not localized in the brain. And the brain has a facilitating function and not a producing function to experience consciousness. So it is, it's an, it is a sender and a an, and an, and an receiver. Uh, for consciousness. So it, it, your, the information from your body and from your senses are sent to your consciousness and you receive information from your consciousness into your body by your brain. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, the, the consciousness is not localized in the brain and not just uh, in the brain but it is everywhere, what I call non-local consciousness because there is no time and no space in this aspect of enhanced consciousness. Mm -hmm. If one assumes that consciousness can also exist outside the body, does that not have consequences for medical ethics? For the way we treat people who are close to death? Yeah, I think it's a very important aspect of, of medicine. I think it ha you have to change healthcare as well, because when you now know from all those people who had any death experience that death is not death, and they tell us that I can live without my body, but my body cannot live without me. I'm still, I'm a conscious being without my body. That means that how do we treat patients in deep coma? How do we patients in the end states of life? What are our thoughts about euthanasia or abortion? What do we do, we do with patients with all this uh, uh, trying to keep the alive with a lot of suffering? instead of let nature do its work. So in a lot of aspects, there are ethical aspects for our healthcare. Has anything changed for you personally since you have been working on the topic of near-death experiences? Also, regarding scientific acceptance of this topic, do you think there have been any developments over the last 10 or 15 years? First of all, of course I changed myself. I, th I think you don't have to experience your own NDE to change when you're open for it. And when you hear, I've heard hundreds of thousands of people telling me about the ND, and I've received thousands of emails or letters from people all over the world telling me about the ND. Then for me, uh, death is something else. Death is just a changing state of consciousness, like birth as well. So there's a continuity of consciousness, in ex uh, uh, not dependent of the body anymore. But I know this kind of approach about the mind-brain relationship is not widely accepted. Most neuroscientists in the world still believe that consciousness is a product of brain function. So there's a lot of skepticism as well, uh, mostly anonymous on website. They attack the messenger and not started a scientific discussion. But it's changing. I think I, I lecture quite a lot in universities, uh, hospitals, hospices, medical students, philosophy students. 
So I got a lot of invitation from all over the world, Yale University or New York Academy of Sciences. So I think it is changing, I'm positive, but it's a slow progress. But I, we know in the history of science that all new ideas, people need time to accept it. And there are always a lot of struggle against new concepts. It's, it's the history of science as well. Dr. Van Lommel, thank you very much for this interview. And I wish you every success in your continued work disseminating these ideas. Thank you.